pronounce everybody's name? Sergiopoulos? Yep. Devitt? Federico? <laughs> Uh, media and presenters, you guys ready for five minutes? Five minutes? Yeah. Yeah, I'll do it. Five minute warning. Right. Deputy, if you don't mind, I'm just going to. Yeah. Do Okay, this conference is going to begin in exactly five minutes. At the uh, three minute mark, I'll be um, giving out the spelling uh, of, all the, uh, of all the people who will be talking. So if you wanna roll at three minutes, I'll give the spelling for that, okay? We still have a little while. Okay, the conference is gonna begin in three minutes. And for media, the spelling of the uh, presenters, we have Deputy Chief Mike Federico, F-E-D-E-R-I-C-O. We have Rob Devitt, he is the CEO of Toronto East General. That's R-O-B, Rob, okay, yeah. Uh, Devitt, D-E-V-I-T-T. -T. And we also have Vicki uh, Sturgiopoulos, She's the psychiatrist in chief of St. Mike's Hospital, and it's V I C K I, uh, sorry, V I C K Y. Sturgiopoulos is S T E R G I O P O U L O S. And um, MCIT, as it will be referred to, is Mobile Crisis and Intervention Team. The conference will begin in exactly one minute. <laughs> sure, <laughs> thanks.
30 seconds. Ten. Good afternoon and thank you very much for coming to Toronto Police Headquarters. Today I'd like to introduce De uh, Deputy Chief Mike Federico of the Toronto Police Service, uh, Vicky Sturgiopoulos, uh, the Psychiatrist in Chief for St. Michael's Hospital, and Rob Devitt, the CEO of Toronto East General Hospital. They will be here to announce the expansion in the city's mobile crisis intervention team program. Deputy. Thank you, Victor. Thanks everybody for coming. Since 2000, the Toronto Police Service has been partnered with our health sector partners in the deployment of a innovative partnership between Toronto Police and the hospitals that serve our emotionally disturbed or mentally ill community. These teams, known as the Mobile Crisis Intervention Teams, pair a police officer with a mental health nurse. The mental health nurse is associated to the psychiatric facilities that, the, uh, that they, uh, serve the client in the community. So I'm always very excited and proud to announce an expansion in that partnership. The partnership now includes North York General Hospital and now serves 32 and 33 division. And while that expansion has resulted in the introduction of a new team into our community, we are working with our existing hospital partners, St. Joseph's, St. Mike's, Humber River, and Scarborough General, to expand the territory of the existing teams so that in 2014, we expect that all areas of the City of Toronto will be serviced by the mobile crisis teams. This has not come with a lot, without a lot of hard work on the part of our, of our partners, particularly the hospitals. And while you'll hear from uh, representatives from the healthcare sector, Dr. Devitt and Dr. Sturgiopoulos, I would also like to acknowledge a retired member of the Toronto Police Service, retired Superintendent Paul Goschak, who was very instrumental in seeing these teams expand. Paul was on the front line when the St. Mike's Hospital team was created and was one of those leading forces in developing the expansion of the teams throughout the City of Toronto. This is a true partnership between our institutions that serve our community these partnerships reflect not only the institution's interest, but our community's interest, and they have had strong input from our consumer survivors. One of the teams, the, the 5450 by division that is partnered with Toronto East General will be available for some discussion after the news announcement. But it is my privilege and honor to introduce to you now um, Dr. Vicki St uh, Sturgiopoulos, who's the uh, lead researcher for the Center of Research on Inner City Health to talk a little bit about the program evaluation. Vicki. Thank you. And it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here today and to have been working with the MCIT steering committee for the past year and a half, trying to understand how MCITs work to address the needs of people in crisis and what might be some areas for program improvement. The little we know from the published literature and all that we learned in the last year and a half confirm that, confirm that MCITs are a very important component of a comprehensive crisis response system. The Center for Research on Inner City Health today launches a report, an evaluation report, synthesizing what we learned from speaking to 57 stakeholders, including mental health, police and consumer stakeholders about the program. And what we heard from them is uh, overwhelmingly positive. MCITs have the potential to uh, provide much needed um, and very appropriate interventions in the community and avoid arrest, criminalization, um, and uh, unnecessary use of hospital resources, as well as provide connection of consumers in crisis to community-based resources. We also heard that the teams and their leadership are very committed to ongoing program improvement through standardization, through um, developing communities of practice where the teams work together to learn from each other and learn together how to best serve this population. 
um, developing best practices in the process. What we also learn is that the teams and their leadership are committed to uh, developing process metrics, to developing indicators and collecting these indicators for public reporting and accountability, and for developing the infrastructure for ongoing program improvement. Last but not least, and perhaps the most important, is that we heard from consumers themselves. And what we heard is that they really value when the teams um, for example, offer them an avenue for de-escalation by listening respectfully, by providing um, healing relationships, by creating an environment of safety, by providing them with empowerment and choice in how to take control of uh, their crisis. And these are important learnings as we try to make sure that they happen in every single interaction of um, MCATs with, with consumers. It would be a missed opportunity if I didn't thank the MCAT steering committee for including research at the table. I think it doesn't happen very often that the critical lens of, of research is used to um, take a look at a program, unpack a program, and um, provide critical insights as to the areas that need improvement and we've been invited wholeheartedly to be part of that process. So I'd like to just express my thanks to the co-chairs of uh, the MCAT Stern Committee and also uh, highlight our own commitment to continue to be part of that process that perhaps we'll look at a more comprehensive evaluation in, this, in the future and to continue informing how best we can improve our crisis response system in the City of Toronto. Once again, thank you very much, and I'll invite Dr. Uh, Rob David, President and CEO of Toronto East General Hospital. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Vicky, and thank you, everyone, uh, for coming today. I want to uh, acknowledge the the two folks who have uh, spoken before me, uh, Deputy Chief Federico and uh, and Vicky, um, but I also want to acknowledge all of the frontline mobile crisis intervention team staff that are here today, nurses and police officers who are working together as teams to, uh, in, in new roles for them, to, to really help us bridge the health and the justice system. And, uh, and this is something that I think is so important for the benefit of our entire collective community. I also want to thank uh, the Lynn, who've sort of been the enabler of, of bringing together all of the uh, the providers on the health side and, uh, and Toronto Police um, and uh, CREACH, the Centre for Research for Inner, Inner City Health. As Vicky has said, we've done something uh, that I think is a little unusual in the healthcare space by having research at the table as we planned expansion and deployment. Um, and so that way decisions could be made based on evidence and not just based on intuition or, or opinion, but actually on, on real evidence. I am really proud of the collaboration that has gone in to, uh, to the creation of uh, a citywide approach to uh, mobile crisis intervention team. This is really a partnership. I mean, it spans multiple hospitals, it spans multiple neighborhoods, spans multiple administrative uh, jurisdictions in terms of LINs, um, and now brings the entire city of Toronto under a, a sort of a standardized, regionalized, uh, approach, if you will, with local deployment and, and local nuances, given that they're based out of hospitals and, and police divisions. Um, and I think it's been uh, a tremendous uh, move, step forward for some of our most vul vulnerable residents. You know, the East General team now has been up and running for about a year. We're already seeing really positive impact as a result of our MCIT. Um, and, and better care for people in, in moments of emotional crisis. Um, and to date, at East General alone, we've served over 500 people through, through the work of our new team. And I think that is, is tremendous. And, uh, and I think as we now expand this across the rest of Toronto, all of our residents will be able to, to get this value. I look forward to us continuing to, to develop the regional model and and lever learnings from the different areas. I think um, this is a really important piece 
in, in building a really comprehensive mental health care system, but it is only a piece. As someone from the health care system, we have to recognize this isn't, this isn't the entire system. It is one key element, um, but a very, very important one. And, uh, and it's been a, a real joy to work hand in hand with uh, Deputy Chief, Chief Federico and, and the entire team. And so with that, I think I'll turn it back to the Deputy Chief to give some closing remarks. Thanks, Rob. I would like to echo how important it is that a partnership approach to incidents and, and events in our community can pay dividends. The partnership really represents more than just the institutions. It represents a community approach. If we're going to deal with mental health, and mental illness, and mental disorders in the community, we need an entire community approach. What you see in the mobile crisis team is one example of the partnerships that can deliver a more effective program than any individual institution can on its own. But I urge the entire community to come and talk about issues around mental health, work together to develop more robust community-based programs, can help people in crisis, and that ultimately we can start to reduce the number of times people actually experience an emergency crisis and have to resort to their institutions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm available for uh, questions, as I know the other speakers are. And we do have the team from uh, the Toronto East General here uh, in, in case there's any questions about the actual operation of the team. We brought them in for your resource. So, so I can open up for questions. Deputy Chief, while you're at the podium, can you explain how many MCITs we have now and how many you're hoping to have by year's end? We've got six teams, and they service 14 of our 17 divisions. And the program expansion for 2014 is to um, expand the existing team's territory so that we actually deliver a service right across all 17 police divisions. So essentially from the, from the um, border with Peel Region to the border with Durham, from the border with York Region to the lake, um, every one of our divisions will have access to a mobile crisis team. You can expect to see that happen in 2014. So no additional teams, it's just expanding the oh. territory. Good question, good point of clarification. Yes, we have introduced an additional team in the North York area. So that's 32 and 33 police divisions, but that's your kind of central north uh, portion of the city. That is a brand new team, an additional team. And Deputy Chief, in terms of the teams and their hours of operation, I mean, there's been recent incidents with police where people have questioned why the teams are off at 11 p.m., some are off at 9. Is there any thought to making them available? 24 hours a day? Yeah, it's a good question. We're always looking at the times and availability of the teams. We base it on the needs. So we do a needs assessment, and so we try and tailor the operations, the hour of operations, to the local community needs. So um, the teams, the hours of operations reflect an analysis of the actual need. Now, obviously, people can experience crisis 24 hours a day, but in trying to deliver what is a um, high cost resource. We need to be both pragmatic and practical about its use. So, but it's a constant topic of discussion, as is the territorial range of the teams as well. Thank you for that. Deputy Chief, um, I know how many uh, people has. Um, the, uh, I know the how many people has the has the team um, or ha has a partnership saved uh, uh, from you know say from suicide or self harm. Uh, Toronto Police um, have encounters with people who are emotionally disturbed at the rate of about 20,000 a year. About 8,500, 8,600 times we may make an apprehension. Of those total numbers, the teams are able to service about um, 2,000, a little less than 2,000. So obviously we want to increase the number of, of uh, clients the teams can, can service, the needs they can meet. Um, but it is a limited resources. So what I want to also emphasize, and I thank you for the question, is that every Toronto police officer is trained to deal with people in crisis, trained to deal with people who are experiencing an emotional disturbance, an emotional crisis. So for those areas of the city that don't have a team available, even when the hours of operation uh, don't allow a team to be uh, deployed, uh, the, the police officers who are on the street are still well trained and well resourced to deal with these kinds of crises and emergencies. The mobile crisis teams add one more dimension 
They add a supplementary dimension to our ability to serve the community, and that's why we find them so valuable. But no community should feel unresourced because a mobile crisis team in that moment might not be available. Thanks for that and, question. And, and the, can this program uh, prevent crimes? Uh, and how, how, to, to, well, to the extent? extent that somebody who's in an emotional disturbance may be committing an offense and we can intervene or we can divert them out of the criminal justice system, then yes, we can help um, prevent crime through the use of uh, our response to emotionally disturbed people. Yeah. I have a question for Mr. Devon. Sure. Do you want to get up there? Mr. Devon, you might want to use the mic. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wondered if uh, you have anything to say about perhaps some programs that are going on in the other end of the mental health system. Uh, we're, what we're talking about is, is sort of the front lines of people in crisis and the end result. And I think the, perhaps the better questions are what help is there available for people who are mentally ill and on the street now? What are you doing? What are your new innovative programs? What we saw at the mental uh, mental illness inquest where they looked at three cases was that every single one of the people who were uh, in an encounter with the police, a fatal encounter with the police, that all had, uh, had all gone to hospital looking for help. Got now, here we are. So sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to give you an idea of some of the stuff we're doing because I would say mental health, like any other type of health, the more we can do to prevent a problem arising, the better. Um, with mental health in particular, one of the things we're doing at East General, and I know a number of other uh, hospitals in Ontario are focusing on, we have a new thing called Health Links, which brings together primary care, so family doctors, and hospitals and community agencies. And, and they were designed to look at high need groups who were either continually using, let's say, the emergency part of the system, um, because they weren't able to get the kind of care they needed in their community uh, to stay well in the community. And one of the key focuses, or foci, I guess, of these health links is the area of mental health. So we're actually looking at building capacity in primary care with our family health team to, to uh, better support uh, people with chronic mental health conditions or, or even acute mental health conditions, better support them in the community. It's not just a hospital primary care opportunity though, it involves working with uh, a whole range of community providers, community agencies, addictions groups, uh, housing, that sort of thing. And that's where HealthLinks is bringing us together. You know, the, the challenge with mental health is uh, unlike some surgical uh, health issues where it's pretty, uh, you know, there's a, a clear problem, a clear solution, um, and then not an ongoing chronic condition. With mental health, we often have sort of an underlying chronic nature to the illness, which requires a very different kind of support, which cuts across healthcare into justice inappropriately. But, and I, I don't mean that as a criticism, but we, the justice system ends up coming in uh, or, uh, or into homelessness, which is not part of the healthcare system. So the Health Links is letting us bring all of that together and hopefully be more responsive. And I know that's a long answer, but it's a complicated uh, system that we need to simplify and, uh, and, and we need to get better at, at early catches as well as better support of the chronically ill, not just mental health, but all chronically ill. System. Just as a follow-up, would you agree that much of the emphasis has been on the ass end of the system, as it were, the, the, the front lines part where the police come in, and much more of the emphasis ought to be on catching the, making the early catches? Oh, I, I think we we are we need to continue to to refocus how we look at at all illness, mental illness and health illness in particular. I, mean, I think we all know it, it wasn't long ago when it was a subject that we didn't even talk about. Um, and when we did talk about it, it was about the institutional piece. And absolutely we need to uh, be much more aware as a community on the need for good community support. Um, and, and that is not just healthcare support. I've gotta keep stressing that. That is housing, that is access to good nutrition all of those things so that people with chronic illnesses can, can uh, be as engaged in society as possible. 
and we do focus in healthcare, unfortunately, on, on the crisis. Uh, and that would be true whether we're talking cardiac illness or mental illness. And we need to keep focusing on prevention. I have a quick question for Deputy Chief. Um, just to follow up to the hours issue, you mentioned that that is based on need, that hours are, are determined by the need and that's done by analysis. Is that an ongoing analysis? Or if not, when was the most recent time that you looked at when the need was? Good question. It is an ongoing analysis. In fact, uh, uh, what Dr. Sturgiopoulos talked about, the program evaluation, um, that is one of the evaluation components, is when, when is the best time for our teams to be deployed? So, of course, we look at it uh, as, as part of a spectrum, and one of them is when is the highest, when's the time of day when the need is the highest, and can we get the teams out there? Um, but I, I do want to repeat that when the teams are not available, our members are well-trained and well-resourced. And actually, just to pick up on, on uh, Christy's comment about um, you know, intervening earlier, one of the toolkits that the teams have is a network of referrals. And so even though the teams are called during a period of crisis, they can perhaps and are very likely to reduce the next episode because they can introduce the person into a stream of care and thereby prevent a future crisis from occurring. So the teams are a preventative um, element as well. Although, as I said, mental health requires a total community response, housing, um, dialogue around destigmatizing the disease, social supports for family, earlier access to medical supports, decent jobs. These are all part of a larger community effort that's going to help reduce the incidence of mental health issues in our community. Police in your hospitals, your institutions and your community agencies are just one component of a larger response. And Dr. Chief, um, is there any communities that make more crisis calls than other communities in Toronto? Um, Toronto, because it's so large. The question is, is how does Toronto compare to other communities? Well, because of the size of our population, we are going to have more instances. It is a sad reality that it seems year after year the encounters with police and those who are emotionally disturbed seems to increase. So um, there is a, a um, growing need for a total community response to this issue. Police will do their job. We will respond to emergencies. We're now partnered with a very effective healthcare partner who can help us deal with the individual, but there's a larger social need that we need to address. How many crisis calls per year? 20,000 times, at least, in, in increasing, we're called to somebody who's emotionally disturbed. And that's when we recognize before we arrive that the person's emotionally disturbed. We get countless calls, thefts, mischief, assaults, even um, situations that you kind of recognize where violence has occurred because we arrive only to discover that the person's experiencing some kind of mental disorder, emotional disturbance, so they can get added to the mix. So this is a, this is a, um, a world issue. It's not just in Toronto, but Toronto has a large population, and therefore you can expect a concentration. We're an urban centre, lots of challenges in our community coping with life, and so it's not surprising that uh, Toronto Police would be on the forefront of responding to people who are emotionally disturbed, and this is why this partnership is so valuable. Deputy Chief, maybe you could just clarify, I mean, there's been a lot of calls and questions of why these MIC, MCITs haven't been called out to certain instances where someone's out of control, they're being violent. Uh, maybe you could just clarify what these teams are for and why they're not called in uh, certain circumstances. Yeah, good question. Um, when, when somebody is an active risk to themselves or to others, we need to have the uh, police officers make the situation safe. And so the primary response officers, those uniform officers that respond to calls for service, they're the best equipped and best trained to deal with that. The person is actually presenting a real risk of harm, physical harm to themselves or to others. The mobile crisis teams are available when, it's, when the conditions have been recognized as one that has a mental health component. But the initial encounter is an encounter to make sure the situation's safe so that there's no assaults, no injuries, no harm. And uh, the primary response teams are the best equipped and trained to do that. The mobile crisis team are partnering a nurse who is not equipped with use of force options, isn't uh, expected or nor has the authority to make an apprehension, it's only the police. 
So that's why the primary response teams in part are there. But the mobile crisis teams are available for that necessary consultation. And once the situation is safe, the primary response can make a referral to the mobile crisis team for that um, post-event uh, care and uh, introduce the person into that stream of community support or institutional support. Good questions, thanks. Any other further questions? Okay, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for coming to police headquarters. That concludes today's conference.